Today, we're going to start the study of PID controllers. In the past few lectures, we are looking at feedback control and we use a very simple controller. The controller was what we can call a proportional controller in the sense that the control action given to the plant is always proportional to the error between the desired and the actual output of the system. But there, could, there are other types of controllers that we can use. What if, for example, instead of making the, uh, the control action proportional to the error, we make that proportional to the integral of the error or proportional to the derivative of the error or a combination of all these three. That's the idea behind the PID controller, which stands for proportional integral derivative controllers. And they are by far the most commonly used controllers in any um, industrial application and in ro robotics and any biomedical system that has some feedback control, 90% of the time it uses a feed, uh, PID controller or some sort of PID control. So you have three components here, the proportional, the integral, and the derivative. And I'm going to split that into two lectures. Today, you're going to look at proportional integral. And then in the next lecture, we're going to do proportional derivative and then PID. Okay. So the objective today is to define what a proportional integral controller is, a PI controller, a subset of PID controller understand the influence of the controller gain in the temporal response and understand the practical applications of the of PI control, proportional integral control. This is a PID controller that you can buy from Amazon. It costs around $80 and it has all the settings here in this where you can select the, the controller gains, the proportional, the integral and the derivative all we have to supply to it is a signal, a voltage, and that a voltage needs to be related to the error in the system. So we somehow measure two quantities, we subtract them, we create an error, we send the error to this machine here. We then say how much we want the output sent to the plant to be proportional to the error, proportional to the integral of the error, or proportional to the derivative of the error. And this unit computes it and then outputs one other, another voltage, which is the one sent the plant. Why exactly are we dealing with proportional integral and derivative gains? We'll see that uh, throughout this lecture in the next one. These are again are by far the most commonly used controllers in the industry and in any biomedical system with any sort of feedback control uh, you're sure to see um, a PID controller. Most of the time though the PI controller is, is more, even more common than a PID. We typically leave the derivative out for some practical reasons that we'll see in the next lecture. So here is the architecture of a PI controller. Nothing new here, except that there is a new loop in the controller. We have an actuator that provides some sort of action to the process, to the plant we want to control. We measure the output and we compare the output with an input, the input R of S and then we create an error. Previously, what we did was very simple. We took this error, we multiplied that by a gain. Let's call that gain here KP, P for proportional. And you took this multiplication and then send that to the plant as the control input. For example, uh, if we are dealing with a mass spring damper system and you wanted to move the mass to point A from point A to point B, we would apply a force to that mass that it would be proportional to the distance to the destination. This has some limitations as we will see, so it doesn't always work. So now we can introduce another element in the controller and that is the integral controller. So we'll take the error now and we'll take the derivative, the integral of the error. So multiply that by one over S, which is equivalent uh, to taking the integral. And you're going to multiply that by Ki, which is now the integral gain. We can now add these two signals and that's the signal we send to the plant now. Now the signal the, the plant receives is proportional to the error itself, but it's also proportional to the integral of the error over time. All right, so this is now our new command signal. So once again here, Ki, Kp, sorry, the other way. Kp, Ki, and the integral. So if you call this signal here, which is the one we sent to the plant U of S, 
or u of t. We can calculate u of s and u of t as a function of the error, and this is the first equation here, u of t is the error times kp plus the integral of the error times ki. If you take the Laplace transform, we have kp times the error of s plus one over s ki times the error. And if you factor out the, uh, the error, that's the expression we have, which is equivalent to kp s plus ki all over s times the error. Okay, now notice that here we have one zero and one pole. We are adding one pole and one zero to the controller. And this will now affect how the poles of the process and the actuator themselves, the, the, the entire, I should rather say the entire closed loop system, including the poles of the actuator and the process, will now be on the S point. Now we are changing, we are adding more poles. Before what we were doing, we are just shifting around poles that are, were already there. Now we are adding one more pole and one more zero. And as we saw in the last lecture, that it will change the way the, the, uh, the poles move and how they can be unstable or unstable and so on. Okay, so now let's see why we want to add the integral controller. So that's a long explanation here, but let's start from the beginning. Let's take this as an example. And then let's do this with a proportional and the integral controller and see what the difference is. So let's assume that we have, we are doing here some sort of a muscle characterization. And the way this is done to estimate the uh, stiffness and the viscous friction coefficient of a muscle sample, what we do is we just apply a force to it at various frequencies, or if we just stretch it, we look at the time response and then we create a function that will match that time response and then you identify the parameters to match the characteristics of the muscle. And in that way, we can now get experimentally the stiffness and the viscous friction coefficient of the said muscle. In this particular example, what we want to do is to attach a string to, to, to that and then make the muscle move to uh, by x zero amount. We're going to apply a force to the muscle and this force is provided by a motor and we can say that the force provided by this motor is proportional to the voltage we apply to it, where alpha is simply a constant k. Right? So you apply a voltage, the voltage creates a force and the force displaces the muscle. Our objective is to make the muscle go precisely at x zero, to travel from its initial position to x zero. Let's see how we can do that using first the open loop controller. Let's do an open loop control. Our, our output here is the position. That's what we want to control. And the position we know is the force over ms squared plus bs plus k, where b is the viscous friction coefficient of the muscle, k is the stiffness coefficient of the muscle. So this is basically just a mass spring damper system. We have seen this equation before. And the force we said is proportional to the voltage applied to the motor. So the top here becomes F V of S, which is the force. If we apply a step input to the voltage of magnitude X zero, say, what is the final value? Let's, let's make it simple. Let's apply a voltage of one Volt, what is the final value? If V of S is in step is one of, over S, how much does the muscle travel? Apply? The steady state value will be alpha over K. Now we can take the limit of this function, make the limit goes, go times S goes go to zero, and the result will simply be alpha over k. So if you apply a voltage with one volt, we'll end up at one over k. That gives us an indication of how much voltage we need to apply. If you want to go, instead of one, we want to go by x zero or x d. So let's do a open loop controller. This is the muscle model. Here we have the controller gain. So this is none of the controller gain, the proportional between the voltage and the force. 
So we apply a for a voltage. The voltage is multiplied by the constant that gives a force, and the force gives a displacement. If we want this to go to XD, a desired displacement, what is the sort of controller we need to put in here? Well, the entire closed loop function goes to uh, when we apply a step input to the plant itself here, it will go to alpha over k. So if we design our controller as the opposite of that, as k over alpha, we'll notice that the output is always the same as the input in the steady state. The output in the steady state will tend to xd. We can do this calculation by simply finding the transfer function, which is just the multiplication of this, all of this, then calculate the limit of, uh, of the transfer function to find the final value. And the final value here will be whatever you put in XD. So if you put a one meter in XD, the output goes to one meter. If you put two meters, it goes to two meters. So what, and this makes sense because what, if you forget about the variable alpha, what this is telling us is that we know if you apply one, one Newton, it will move by one over K. So if you want this to move by X Newton, just, just put a, a voltage that is now X times K is the inverse of that. Right? And this will ensure that the system reaches the, always the point we want. So there's a problem with this controller here because we need to know precisely what K is and you need to know precisely what alpha is. Without that information, we cannot design a proper controller. And there is another issue is that they, there might be a model dynamics here, for example, some friction or external disturbances that will add a un, uh, unwanted force to the model, which we cannot account for. So this only works provided that there is no disturbance and provided that we know the model perfectly. Now let's try to do a closed loop controller instead. And the closed loop controller would take a very similar form, but now uh, it would follow this structure. We have a desired displacement. We, we have the actual displacement to create an error, multiply that by a constant KP, that it gives us the uh, voltage we apply to the motor. We send that to the plant. The voltage is converted into a force and the force makes the mass move. So we are saying here that the control action is proportional to the error between the desired and the actual position. So let's assume that this mass is starting at zero and is moving towards X zero. So when we first start the system, the mass is at zero. It will start to receive some force and it will slowly ramp up and is going towards X zero. What is the error in the beginning? In the very first step, what is the error? When time is zero, when we start the system, what would be the error? X well, zero? X zero, exactly, X zero, because we are sending here X zero and the system is starting at zero. So the initial error is X zero. So the initial uh, uh, voltage that we apply to this would be x0 times k. That's where we start. That is the initial voltage given to the motor. But now you see the, the mass is moving towards the destination. So the error is slowly decreasing, which means that the voltage given to it will also slowly decrease. And the mass will continue to move towards x0. and the controller will slowly decrease the voltage applied to the motor. Do you see a problem with this approach? Do you see any potential issue with this it's approach? Slow. Yeah? Is it slow? It's slow, that's one, yeah. There's a more fundamental problem, is that we can never reach X zero. Why? Why the mass can never reach X zero? Yeah. 
because we are saying that the voltage is proportional to the error. If we get to x0, then, x, then the error is zero, and the voltage applied to the motor becomes zero, and the, and the, the, the spring will just pull the mass back. We can never reach X0. We can get close to X0 because for a control action to exist, there must exist an error. Without an error, there is no control action because the control action is proportional to it. So we will go to X0 and when you reach X0 with some inertia at X0, we say, oh, there is no error. Turn everything off and then the mass goes back. If the spring wasn't there, it wouldn't be an issue. It would indeed maybe go to X0, but the spring is always pulling the mass backwards, which means that we, there must be a force holding it on the other direction. And that force is only present provided that there is an error, non-zero error in the system because our assumption, our controller is designed in such a way that the control action is proportional to the error. When you can see this here, we see if you take Mathematically, we take the closed loop transfer function, which is uh, written in red here to save some time, and we find the steady state error for, say, a step input uh, of one uh, unit. We can calculate the steady state error as the limit when S tends to zero of S times the input, which is going to be here, a uh, step input times one minus Kp alpha divided by S squared plus Bs plus K plus Kp alpha. I remember that this is R of S, right? This is also multiplied by R of S. I just factor out of S and uh, R of S is one over S. And when you calculate this limit, this gives one minus Kp alpha divided by K plus Kp alpha which is the same as Kp plus Kp alpha minus Kp alpha all divided by K plus Kp alpha, which is finally K over K plus Kp alpha. How can this error be zero? It can't. There is no way to change, to, to make the zero. We don't have control over K. K is a characteristic of the system. All we can change is Kp there. The higher Kp, the smaller the steady state error, but it's never zero. And it makes perfect sense if we go back here, because when the error is zero, there is no voltage. And the math says the same thing. We can never make the steady state error zero for uh, positive gains of Kp, or negative gains would make the whole thing unstable. Okay, so that's an intrinsic limitation of what we have been doing is that we can never eliminate the steady state error. Are there any questions here? Uh, Professor, can you just go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Yeah, so here, uh, I'm not quite sure for the second uh, graph mm -hmm. so why it is start from the x0 because x is the, the the mass move from the zero to the position x0 but why here start at the x0 yeah so when we our objective is to make is to make the mass go to x0 right yeah so our desired input is x0 desired output when the mass first first starts it starts from zero so this signal here is zero. So the error here is x zero minus zero, which is x zero. Okay. We multiply that by Kp and V of S, the initial voltage is Kp times x zero. Okay, this is what got times it. zero, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? It's very important to understand why the steady state error can never be eliminated. Is that, is that clear? Professor, could you please explain the steady state part of the equation? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was moving my, my uh, papers here. Okay. Could you please explain the steady state part when you did like the limit and the sense to zero? Yeah, 
So this, I'm taking a big shortcut here. I'm assuming that uh, we're okay with this from past lectures. So I'm calculating the limit of S times the error. And the error is R of S or uh, XD. Let's put it this way, XD. We previously called it R of S. XD minus the transfer function times XD. Factoring out XD and assuming that XD is a step function one over S gives one minus H of S, which is this transfer function there. Okay, uh, this is, uh, if you go back to the steady state error, this is exactly the same thing I'm doing now. I'm just taking some shortcuts because I want to focus on something else. Okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll post the full solution later. Uh, one thing to notice here is that, as I said, the problem is that the spring is always moving, trying to move the mass back. Now notice that if you put the spring to zero here, we just have a mass damper system. Then when the air is zero and there is no voltage applied to the motor, to, to the, the mass, then the mass is nothing else moving it. So it would just stay there, which means this could go to zero if the spring wasn't there, if the spring was, was zero. And this is precisely what the equation also shows because if K is zero, there is no spring, there is no steady state there. Right? But for when the spring is present, then we can never eliminate it. Now let's look at a proportional integral controller for the same problem. We have the same structure of controller, but now we see we have the top loop here that is now looking at the integral of the air. We are adding this to, and this is the voltage we apply to the motor. So the mass is doing the same thing. Is it starting from zero and is going towards XD? I'm assuming here that the system is overdamped, but it could very well be underdamped. The error will follow the same. We start to decrease. And we have a proportional controller. The proportional controller will do the same. It will start high and then it starts to slowly decrease. So this is the error times Kp. But now we have the error times Ki that is integrated over time as well. So when you do that, what you are doing, you are taking the error and you're taking the integral of error over time and you're multiplying that by a constant. So what we are essentially doing is calculating the area under this curve and in the time t equals to t1, the integral controller would apply that area times ki as a voltage to the motor. And in parallel at time, T equals uh, T1, the, in, the, the uh, proportional controller would simply apply this value here, uh, X, let's call that X1 times Kp. And we add them together, we send them to the plant. So the integral, the pro proportional controller is the same. Now the integral controller is that area and that area will start to increase over time. As the area is increasing over time, you see that we are now adding more action to the system. We have the controller receiving also a command from the integral controller. The force will increase, so the mass is moving towards X zero, the error is decreasing, and there is a point where the mass actually reaches X zero. What happens to the proportional controller? Well, the proportional controller goes to zero and it doesn't do anything anymore because the error is zero. What happens to the integral controller? Well, the integral of zero is simply its past values because you're again taking all this integral and when you reach this point where the error becomes zero, the integral simply becomes constant. What do we do now? We take these two, we add them together and this is V of S. This is the voltage. The integral controller in the steady state, it doesn't do anything because it, the, the proportional controller doesn't do anything because it's zero. The error is zero if we reach the destination. But now the integral controller is non-zero because it looked at the past error 
integrated the past error. And when the error became zero, it just becomes constant. And now we are applying something to the volt to the motor that is not zero, even though the error is zero. And this is sufficient to now hold the mass at that point. So there will be a force pulling it. There is a spring pulling in the other way. And the mass stays at zero, at, at an X zero in equilibrium. The whole entire job in a steady state is being done by the integral controller. Proportional controller did its thing, made the mass accelerate towards X zero. When you reached X zero, it not, doesn't do anything. Now it's the integral controller that kind of takes over. Okay. And we can conclude from this that the integral controller eliminates the steady state error. And you can further say that it will eliminate the steady state error regardless of the value of ki. It will, if this, uh, if ki is very small, this, this integral will simply build, build up slowly, but it will eventually uh, build up enough uh, voltage to make the mass move slowly towards x zero. So if we had, let's say, a high proportional gain and a small integral gain, the mass would first jump towards x zero, stop a few millimeters behind x zero, and then the integral controller, which is integrating the air is slowly goes up, it slowly increases the voltage, and then the mass is slowly reaches X zero. So it, do, it does a initial jump and then it slowly reaches that. Professor, I'm a little confused because like you said that when the error is zero, the proportional controller is like basically done its work and now it's up to the integral mm -hmm. controller and that is integrating the error, right? Yeah. But the integral of zero is zero. No, the integral of zero is a constant. Oh, okay, okay. Right, and it, it, when we are doing the the, inter, the integration here, uh, well, that, that was a bit of a, a misleading statement. It's not really a constant, but let's look at it this way. If you're taking the integral of this curve, uh, this curve here, the integral of that curve is the area. So when we are here, we are dealing with this area. And we are there, we are de dealing with plus that area, plus that area, plus that area. And eventually it will become a constant because it's zero, but we are already, we already took the integral of all this, right? So this point here represents the area under that curve. Right, it's the integration over time. It's not the integration of an instant in time. It's the integration over time. Oh, okay. Thank right. you. That makes sense. Any, any other questions? Um, so we, um, in the last slide, we said uh, the error never becomes zero because of the nature of our um, um, controller here. Um, but in the next slide, uh, when it when the error becomes zero, mm -hmm. um, does the motor let go for a second? Because no, no, it, 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 because the uh, what we are at, uh, actually giving to the plant now is the addition of these two. See, there's a sum here. So at any point oh, in time, you see, even past the point where the steady state error is zero, the control action. Sorry. Control action is never zero. It's constant at um, a non-zero value. And if we want to draw the addition of these two graphs, uh, how would it look like? Uh, it would look like... Roughly... Something like... Something like this. Thank you. It's starting from the same point, which is KP times X zero. Okay. And this is the actual voltage we give to the motor. Now let's uh, look at the steady state error for this one. Here's the transfer function. If you want to calculate the steady state error for a step input, 
I'm going to take a shortcut here again to save some time because we addressed this before, but essentially this is what I'm doing. And the error is xd minus x for a step input. That would be the limit when s tends to zero of s times one over s, one minus the transfer function. And this turns out to be one minus this term goes to zero when s goes to zero, one minus one, which is indeed zero. Now you can calculate this with more time uh, on your own. It's the same thing we did before, but you can prove mathematically, that's the message, that the steady state error indeed goes to zero. And it goes to zero independently of the value of ki. So if I ask you the following question, the um, The, the the higher the, the integral gain, is it true or false? The question that I put in the exam before, it was a true or false question. The, in, the question was, the higher the integral gain, the smaller the steady state error. Is it true or is it false? And the question, the answer is, it's false because the steady state error is always zero, so long as the integral gain is present. The value of ki will regulate how fast the integral controller will bring the steady state error to zero, but eventually it will go to zero. I'm sorry, and the greater ki, uh, the faster uh, we reach the steady state? The greater ki, the more action we give to the system, the faster it will eliminate the steady state error. It may increase overshoot, it may lead to a higher settling time. Uh, the, that's something that we have to analyze separately. What we can say is that the higher Ki, the faster the steady state error is eliminated. Right. But not necessarily that it reaches a steady state faster. And that's the point of the next, uh, the next example, is that because now we have a second part of our controller adding more energy to the mass, we may create a underdamped system and the mass may see some oscillations. The way to reduce these oscillations is to add a third component, which is the derivative component that we're gonna see that in the next lecture. So here are the two comparisons for some random values of uh, random values of um, B and K and A and KI and KP. I want the motor to go to XD we give that a step input. So the motor initially moves the mass and the mass will not quite reach that uh, value. It will stay a little under it. So this is the proportional controller only. Look at the voltage. The voltage goes from zero to a high value. And then as is exactly the error. And then this much uh, voltage here is simply Kp times the error in a steady state right, that is holding the mass at that specific position, not quite at where we want it to be. Now let's look at the integral controller here. In the integral controller, we can see that there is more overshoot, there is more oscillations because we are now injecting more energy into the system. We have a second branch in our controller, but let's look at what happens to the proportional and the integral. This would be the proportional part this would be the integral part of the voltage. The proportional part is simply proportional to the error. So it would be, you see that eventually the error goes to zero, so does the proportional voltage. And you see that the integral component is integrating this area here, all this error. And eventually it reaches a steady state at a non-zero value. We add these two and you send it to the plant. So the voltage in the steady state is the voltage being provided by the integral control. Okay. So we can say in other words that uh, the proportional gain always looks at the current error. We'll take action based on the current error at a, uh, at a current time. 
whereas the integral gain considers the past error because it takes the integral of past error. So one is present, one looks at the past. Now let's look at the um, PI controller, uh, effects of KI and KP. This is something we did before. We know uh, this is for a different plant. What is the effect of KP in the steady state error? We can take the transfer function, calculate the uh, steady state error for a unit step input. That's uh, the same thing we did before. And this is the result here, which can be rewritten as two over KP plus two. So same thing we did before, just with different numbers. We can see that the steady state error can never be made zero. They can be made as, as small, by increasing KP, but never zero. Now let's look at the integral gain only. So this is just an integral controller. And let's look at the steady state error, what we already did in the uh, calculation. And you saw that so long as we have a integral gain, the error goes to zero. But this may also affect the other parts of the system now, such as the damping ratio and the natural frequency. So if you take the same plant we just used one over s plus two add a integral controller to it instead of a proportional controller we can calculate the transfer function of the closed loop system that is y over x and the transfer function is shown here now notice that ki shows up in the denominator ki now dictates the natural frequency of the system and therefore also the damping ratio of the system the natural frequency becomes the square root of ki the damping ratio to zeta um, omega n is equal to two, and the damping ratio becomes one over the square root of ki. And this is a problem now, because the higher ki, the smaller the damping ratio. And what does that mean in practice? The higher the overshoot will be, the higher ki, All right? KI decreases the damping ratio, and as we decrease the damping ratio, we may enter even an unstable zone. But we are essentially increasing now the overshoot with the value of KI. And that's the main downside of having a PI controller. The integral gain always adds some overshoot because it decreases the damping ratio of the system. Right? But on the other hand, it eliminates steady state error and you can deal with overshoot later by adding the derivative controller in the next lecture. The effects of the uh, integral controller in the steady state, well, uh, we can again do the same calculation and we'll see that it will always be zero regardless of the value of Ki. Right? This is another example. If you do a step input here with a Ki a PI, uh, uh, an integral controller, the error goes to zero once again. Let's summarize then this in this table. We have a proportional controller and an integral controller combined. So if we increase KP, the proportional gain, the overshoot increases, the settling time doesn't change, the steady state error decreases. If you go with an integral controller, it will increase the overshoot, it will increase the settling time, and will make the steady state error zero. So here is the trade-off in our design, because settling time and overshoot increases, increase with the integral controller, but the steady state error goes to zero, and that's the only way to eliminate the steady state error. We cannot do that with the proportional controller alone. Okay? Are there any questions? It's such a simple architecture uh, for a controller and uh, it works very well. In practice, all we have this <coughs> implemented all the time. We do, um, I'll give you an example. We have robot arms that um, are used to do kidney stones removal on phantom tissue and they are expected to follow a given path. And to make them follow that given path, we want them to be exactly on the path. We, we can't allow for any error to exist. So an integral controller is always part of the controller. 
to make sure that the, there is no steady state error. The tip of the robot always goes where we want it to be. Right? Whereas the, um, into the proportional controller also helps it move smoothly and fast enough to uh, follow that given trajectory. Are there any questions before we do some exercises? No? What is important in this lecture, all these little math steps, we, we've done them before. I wanted to focus on the concept itself. What is the difference between a proportional and integral controller and why exactly the proportional controller eliminates the steady state error without the need for any math why is the steady state always uh, steady state error always zero with an integral controller? That's essential to understand. Let me give you an example here of uh, practical application of this. We have this is unstable plant one uh, one over s plus one s minus five. So uh, and we want to stabilize this plant, which is unstable. We can see that we have a pole here as s plus five. It has a positive real part, the entire system is unstable. So without control, this plant is unstable. We want to put this in a controller gain, a controller loop, and stabilize the system. The first attempt that we can make here is to just to have a controller gain and then C of S, which is a function we can design. Uh, and let's assume that a C of S for now is just one. So, which means that we are left with a proportional controller. There's a K, is it still there? If you do the root locus of this system with a proportional controller, we would see something like this. These two poles that the system has, one a negative one and one a positive five, would meet somewhere in the unstable zone. One would go up, one would go down. With a proportional controller, the system remains unstable. It can never be stabilized, regardless of the value of k because the pole at negative uh, plus five is either coming here and going up or coming here and going down, doesn't matter. It's in, in the unstable region, regardless of the value of K for K between zero and infinity. So proportional controller doesn't really help with our case. What if we make C of S in a way that we will eliminate that unstable pole. If we make C of S, S minus five, divided by s, which is the same as one minus five over s. So here you see the proportional part, which is one. Here you see the integral part, which is five over s. What happens? We are adding a zero at negative five and we are adding a pole at zero. So the pole in the original pole at negative one from the plant is still there. The pole at positive five is there, but now we are adding a zero on top of it because of the addition of our PI controller. We also added a pole at zero here. These two cancel out. Now these two here will meet somewhere in the middle. One goes up and one goes down. But now they do that in the stable zone and the system now can be closed loop stable by properly tuning the control gains. This is a terrible design because we need to know exactly where that a pole is to cancel it out. There are other designs that it would make a better job, but this is theoretically a, poss um, a possibility to place this, the, the zero from the proportional, from the PI controller exactly where the unstable pole is, cancel it out. We are adding another pole because of the uh, S in the, the origin there. And now the system becomes closed loop state. Okay, so that's one useful application here. With a proportional controller, if you look at the root locus, we can tell immediately that the system can never be stabilized. But with a PI controller, we just need to be smart as where exactly how we select the gains ki and kp in such a way that the pole, the zero that we add to the system cancels the unstable pole. Okay. Let's do some exercise. 
Let's start with this one. Here we have a closed loop system with an integral controller that is designed to maintain the blood pressure at a constant value with some sort of machine. If K equals to 20, determine the settling time within 2% of the final value of the system to a unit step disturbance. Determine the final value of the system to a unit step disturbance. So here we clearly have a plant and here we have the controller. K is given as 20. Uh, it, would, it would have been better to put a K with the controller as the integral gain, but that's okay. Determine the final value of the system to unit step, uh, no, determine the settling time within 2% of the final value to unit step disturbance. Where is the disturbance? It's missing, or well, where should we put it? Would the disturbance go here? or here, let's call this A or B, which one is the right one? The B, A? B. A, B. Where, let's, let, me, let me ask you this question, man. where does the disturbance act? On the plant, it acts on the plant. So if it acts on the plant, it's at B. Right. At A, it would be implying that the disturbance is acting directly on the controller. Remember that this is the controller. This is the plant. So the disturbance indeed acts at B, which is missing from the diagram here. But we, we know that now we should go in here. Let's call that T. Okay. If we want to calculate the steady state, the settling time for a disturbance, then we need to set our input to zero and redraw the block diagram where T is now the input. T goes to the plant, okay, which is 20 over S plus 20. There we have Y of S. Here in the feedback loop, we have S multiplied by minus one times one over S, which is simply minus one. So this entire thing here is negative one and I'm putting the negative there. Right, S times one over S is simply S. There is a negative sign here. Don't forget that. I made it come down. Sorry, can you quickly explain again uh, why we crossed RS? Why why did, why we said RS goes to zero? Yeah, so we are again using the principle of superposition. If you want to do, we have two inputs. So you want to evaluate one of them. We must set the other one to zero. When you want to evaluate the effect of R in the output, then set T to zero. And if you want to evaluate their effect concurrently, then just add the results up because the system is linear. So superposition applies, All right? We can only do one at a time. A transfer function only has one input, one output, All right? So you are concerned with the disturbance input, set the other input to zero. What is the closed loop transfer function here, y of s over r of s? And wouldn't it be t of s in this case? Then? t of s, yeah. Sorry. What is the transfer function? Transfer function is 20 over S plus 
20 plus 20, 40. Right? If we do the closed loop transfer function, that's what you should get, right? It's the line function divided by one plus line function. This will be the result. Uh, if we want to evaluate the step disturbance, then T of S becomes one over S. And we'll just multiply the function by one over S. This is the output Y of S. Now here we could use the, uh, if you want to find a settling time, we would have to find the damping ratio and the natural frequency. But in fact, here we have a first order system. This is coming from the input, right? So this doesn't make the second the system second order. The system is a first order system. We'll have to now find a way to calculate the time response and then uh, see what a value of t will take that are within 2% of the final value. And to do that, we have to expand this into partial fractions, find the inverse Laplace transform. I'm going to give you the partial fraction of this. We have two terms. We have this term and that term. And if I remember correctly, this should be one half of one over S minus one half of 20 times S plus 40. Okay. That's the partial fraction. Now we can do the inverse Laplace. And what is the inverse Laplace of that? That's y of t. And what is it? It's one half, if you factor that out, of one over s. That's one minus 20, log, 20 exponential of negative 40 t. I'll double check this 20 here. But I'm not sure if this is actually 20. It might be one. So this would have been one. I'll check that later and then I'll post the final value, the, the right value in the final solution. But there, there's a constant here, so it doesn't change the shape of the output. I'm just not, not too sure if it's 20 or not. Uh, so this is now the time response of this to a step input. If we plot the time response now, what do we get? we'll get time and y of t. What is the final value as t tends to infinity? What is the Should final be value? Zero? Should be as t tends to infinity. This goes to zero, but this remains, right? So it goes to one half. When t tends to infinity, this term goes to zero, but one half times one remains. So it should go to one half. Do something like this, or the final value is one half. As time goes to infinity. Now the question says the term in the value of the, 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 uh, the settling time within 2% of its final value. In other words, the question is asking to determine the time at which the system reaches 2% of its, is within 2% 2, 2 of its final value. So we could be at one and a half plus 2% of one and a half, or it could be at one and a half minus 2% of its final value. This first one here is 0 0.51. The bottom one is 0 0.49. So we are saying as soon as we cross into this region, as, as soon as we are at 0 0.49, we are within 2% of the final value. 
and we don't exceed, we don't, we don't oscillate outside of that bound. We are always within 2% of the final value. That means plus or minus 2%. So the first point where we reach that condition is 0 0.49, which is one half minus 2% of one half, which is uh, 0 0.01. So that's 0 0.49. Is this clear? Any questions here? Um, in the transfer function on the right, how come your denominator is um, s plus 40? Shouldn't it be s plus 20? No, s plus 4. This is the closed loop transfer function here. Right? So that is 20 over s plus 20 divided by 1 plus 20 s plus 20. Oh, OK. Which is 20 over s plus 20 plus 20 s plus 40. Right, this is the, the open loop. This is the, the closed loop. Are we good here with this 2% idea with the final value? Yep. Yeah? OK, now what do we do? If you want to know the time it takes to reach 0 0.49, well, just equate y of t to 0 0.49 and solve for t. And this is 0 0.t equals to 0 0.088 seconds. It will take 0 0.88 seconds to reach 0 0.49. So if you plug t back in here we should get 0 0.49 and 0 0.49 is the point where we we enter the two percent zone within uh, of the final value again I, I have to double check this constant here everything else up to, i'm sure about uh, up to this point is this constant 20 this co constant i have to check that later but it should be it should be it should be correct Okay, any, any questions here? We good? So this is a purely integral controller, right? purely integral controller. What this is telling us is that if there is a disturbance, the output will be stabilized in 0 0.088 seconds as a result of that disturbance. Any questions? No, no good. Okay. All right, so let's do uh, another one then, if there are no questions. We could do this exercise, but this one was in the assignment. I actually put this one in the assignment. It, if you look at it, it's also uh, some sort of a proportional integral controller. We can skip that and we already have the solution. Uh, so did somebody have a question? Um, so can we just see the... Um question for the solution again which question J the one that we just did yeah that's question number one. Oh, okay thanks yeah that one. Oh, thanks yeah professor why did we um go with 0 0.49 instead of 0 0.51 sorry i missed that so the final value is one half right you want to be within 2% of that value. So it's one half plus 2% of one half and one half minus 1% of one half. If the final value was one, let's put it that way, we would be within 0 0.98 and 1.02. Right? But you are at one half. So 2% of one half is 0 0.01. So plus minus that 0 0.51, 0 0.49. The settlement yeah. time is defined within 2%, the final value. 
Yeah, but in the solution, we use 0 0.49. Why did we disregard 0 0.51? No, we, we, because uh, we are never, the, the question states when you are within 2%. So the reach, the, the, the point where we enter the 2% zone, the first time we enter the 2% zone and we remain in the 2% zone without going out, that's 0 0.49, right? Because you're going this way, we cross into this zone at 0 0.49 and we never exceed. Uh, okay. that. Let's say we had something like this instead. This is a bit exaggerated like that what point would we would we be at 2% of the final value? Well, not this one, because you just exceeded it here. Here we came back into the zone, T2, and, never, and we are not leaving it. So this would be point T2, which would be, in that case, 0 0.51. Okay, thank you so much. Um, also, when we said we are using superposition here, um, but when the question is asking just um two percent of the final value due to the unit step disturbance mm -hmm. um now we don't consider um the part for the part of the superposition for r of s no because r of s will not change this value r of oh, s will have its own effect in the output and that's the whole point of superposition it will do its own thing but the effect of the disturbance is what it is. It doesn't depend on ROS, right? And that's the advantage of having a linear time invariant system. Okay. All right, let's do uh, quickly exercise three. I'll solve this one on the tablet here. Uh, we have I'll let you guys read this and this key this question is from a I believe it's from a either a midterm or a final exam we have a controller CUS that was developed for the unstable plant shown uh, the root locus of the feedback control system as a function of k are presented so see this is this root locus includes C of s it has everything in there, includes C of S. We don't know what C of S is, but we have the root locus of the resulting system. And then you have some statements and you want to know if those statements are true or false. The first thing to uh, do here is to determine what kind of controller we are dealing with. The original plant had a pole at negative one, in a pole at negative zero at a positive 0 0.5 here and it didn't have a pole at the origin at all it wasn't there we only had negative one and positive 0 0.5 now once we included c of s in the in the in the loop we ended up with with the pole at 0 0.5 disappearing and another pole appearing at zero what kind of controller did that? Well, C of S clearly eliminated the pole at 0 0.5. So we must have added the zero at 0 0.5 and also added a pole at zero. So it has a pole like that. All right, so S plus 0 0.5 would place a zero here. The zero and pole cancel out and then we add the S at the origin. So based on the new location of poles, we can tell that this is what kind of controller? PI. Is a PI. And what is the value of KI and KP? KP uh, is- One and the zero, uh, KP is one and KI is zero, uh, 0 0.5 over S. Very good. Uh, Ki uh, is just 0 0.5, not, not over s. K, the gain is. Oh, 0. oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So with this information, you can answer now the questions. Uh, the first one is C of P, a PI, PD controller. We haven't addressed it yet, but it was assumed there was a PI controller. 
it would be true for a PI controller. False for a PD controller, that's the proportion of derivative. Question number two, for K is smaller than 0 0.25, there is no overshoot. Is this true or false? So this now goes in here. And we still have a controller K that we are changing over time. The root locus is when data K goes from zero to infinity. The question says that all that when K is 0 0.25, the two poles are here in that point. Now, when K is less than 0 0.25, is there overshoot or not? So is the second statement true or false? It's true. It is true. Very good. It is true. Why is it true? Because for k smaller than 0 0.25, this pole is in this range. And the other pole is in that range. They are both real numbers lying on the real axis. The statement is indeed true. Third and then they are under them in that case. Uh, later, they may become under them. Yeah. But they are over damped. Uh, oh, yes. oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, yes, right. they are. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry, didn't understand that. Yeah, they are over that. Yeah, they are over them. Yeah. Third statement: If one k tends to infinity, the system is unstable. True or false? False. It is True. false. So why is that false? Because when k tends to infinity, the poles one is going up, one is going downwards. Right, and um, they are in the stable zone. They don't cross into the unstable zone. So the system is indeed closed loop stable for any k greater than zero. The third statement says for k greater than 0 0.25, the system is under damped. Is this true or false? True. True. True, because now we pass that point and we are here, we have complex numbers. And the complex numbers now characterize a underdamped system. And the last one, at the breakaway point, the system is undamped. Is this true or false? False. It is false. So where is the breakaway point? Well, the breakaway point is, oops is right here. And this characterizes what kind of system when the two poles are the same. Critically damped. Critically damped. Very good. Critically damped. The system is not undamped. It is actually critically damped. This is false. It would be critically, uh, it would be undamped if the poles were lying on the imaginary axis. Okay, simple. Professor, um, yep. I'm, I'm a little confused about the first one, um, mm -hmm. how you concluded that the system, that C of S was a PI controller because you added 0 0.5. Like previously we did an example where um, the, in the transfer function there was like, in, there was a real pole. There was a pole on the positive side of the real axis and you subtracted five in that case. So like, mm -hmm. why did we add five, add 0 0.5 here? Yeah, so uh, we should, I made a mistake on the sign, it should be zero, negative 0 0.5, right? Because we want the controller to be S minus 0 0.25 times S times the plant S plus one S minus 0 0.25. These two will cancel out and you're left with one over S S plus one. And now we have a pole at zero and a pole at one. This is what we see in the root locus. So to achieve that, to add a zero at the origin, we need one over S. To cancel out the pole, we need to add a zero at negative. Uh, we have to add a zero at 0 0.5. And to add a zero to add a, a 0 0.5, we need to add S minus 0 0.5, right? So that the zero is at plus 0, plus 0 0.5.
right? So that was my bad. I should have written S minus 0 0.5 from the beginning. If, if we had 0 0.9, 0 0.5, that would not work. We would be adding another pole right here. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. And this would become an interesting. Yeah. So what would happen in that case? In that case, we would be adding two poles. We would be adding a pole. Now, what pole in a zero? So we would have a pole here, which is the original one, and we would have a zero there. So how would this look like? These two poles would come together and it would travel this way. Now it would travel upwards, excuse me, like that and like this. And this zero and that pole would meet somewhere in there. And you see here, the, there is always two unstable poles. So if, with my original S plus 0 0.5, the system would still be unstable. Uh, professor, so mm -hmm. if in the case we run the system to be stable, we always add a pole uh, at zero? If we are dealing with a proportional, in, uh, an integral controller, there are always going to be a pole at zero, yes. Okay, good to know. All right, can you re explain how you made the CS equation? Yep. Let's just start from the beginning. What is the characteristic equation of this system? If you do the characteristic equation, that is the denominator of the transfer function, which will be one plus K times C of S times one over S plus one. S minus 0 0.5. The original transfer function, when uh, if we didn't have C of S there, and if you only had a proportional controller K, would have uh, had a pole at plus 0 0.5 and another pole at negative one. This would be the original transfer function if C of S was equal to one, right? These are the location of poles for the characteristic equation. It turns out that after we use C of S, this pole at 0 0.5 disappeared and a zero appeared at zero. So C of S clearly has a zero at the origin, uh, a pole at the origin because of this one that I just showed up here. It shouldn't be there. It's not part of the plan. It came from somewhere else. It must have come from controller. And the pole at 0 0.5 disappeared, which means that we must have added a zero at S plus 0 0.5 minus, sorry, minus 0 0.5. so that the that pole disappears. And indeed, when we do this, when we now replace C of S with this specific transfer function, we have a characteristic equation that will be one plus K times one over S, S uh, minus plus one. All right, because this 0 0.5 and this 0 0.5 will cancel out. We are left with this one over S and that one. So, as a conclusion, because now the poles moved where they are, they can only do that provided that a C of S is S minus 0 0.5 divided by S, which is one minus 0 0.5 over S proportional integral gains.